Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, June 21st, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, a moderate Muslim role model speaks out against homosexuality. Punishment is one of five things. One, the easiest one maybe, chop their head off. Then, Hillary's been hacked. Guccifer 2.0 chronicles hundreds of new documents that reveal a series of scandals directly linked to the criminal Clinton Foundation. Meanwhile, Donald Trump announces his takedown plan for crooked Hillary. Plus, inside the FBI's facial recognition database, 411 million photos of 90% non-criminals. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. More internal memos hacked from the DNC servers have been released. And now this one's being called the Hillary Clinton dossier. This is a 42 page leaked DNC document titled Clinton Foundation Vulnerabilities Master Doc Final. And it shows that the Clinton Foundation scandals are the major vulnerabilities for what the DNC has been preparing for. Now it totals over 22,000 words in length and it paints a portrait of a political party that's been besieged by media coverage of foreign Clinton Foundation donations. But I really think they overprepared because as we've seen, that really hasn't happened. Now obviously some media outlets have reported on these things, but they haven't really done a lot of digging into exactly what was going on. But the DNC, as you can see, was really prepared for them to go after a lot of her scandals. Now, these are politically toxic to the DNC as far as the Clinton's foundation's acceptance of foreign donations during her tenure as Secretary of State. Um, the Clinton Foundation received donations from individuals tied to Saudi Arabia while she served as Secretary of State. And indeed, we reported on how there was a video that briefly surfaced. It was immediately taken down, but it was a Saudi prince talking about how uh, they had invested almost 25 million into Hillary Clinton's campaign, even though she's a woman. You know, look how liberal he is. He, he's helping to prop up our political leaders here, which of course is illegal. So that right there looks very bad on her. Uh, but you can see in all the sections um, titled Clinton Foundation Individual Foreign Donors, these are headlines that people working for the DNC kind of made up themselves showing they were really concerned about these scandals and they internally knew that this was a big problem. Why can't the rest of America uh, see that as well, people who are still with her. And also they go on to talk about the debacle that was the Clinton Foundation's handling of billions of dollars of taxpayer funds uh, going to help rebuild Haiti. A complete disaster there. Uh, that was in 2010. Many of those people are still living in tents. But the Clinton Foundation did a really good job at building up a nice resort and a five-star hotel. So good job while the, a lot of the billions of tax, tax dollars are just laying waste there. Um, and also too, this is kind of showing the vulnerability of the servers because the Clinton Foundation said that her servers have uh, been breached by Russian hackers, but the Clinton Foundation says, you know, well, we didn't, we haven't been notified of the breach and they declined to comment even further, even though they have released documents showing the names of donors, uh, how much they have given to the Clinton campaign and a lot of other personal information, but they're going to deny and say everything is okay. Hillary Clinton came out today and attacked Donald Trump on the economy. She was basically saying that if you give Donald Trump, uh, put him behind the steering wheel of American, uh, the American economy, he's going to likely drive it off a cliff and working families would bear the brunt. But hopefully Donald Trump will respond with the obvious that that's exactly what the Democrats have already done. They've driven the economy over the cliff and her husband actually signed NAFTA. So 5 million jobs were transferred to low wage authoritarian hell holes in China and Asia. Democrats are of course pushing hard for uh, the TPP, which is uh, a central player in TPP is Vietnam. The average hourly rate there is a dollar five per hour. And so a lot of transnational corporations are just chomping at the bit to get this passed so that they can ship even more jobs offshore 
uh, where they're going to be able to rake in higher profits because it's lower cost of labor and compliance costs. So we're going to be hearing that giant sucking sound once again. Hillary Clinton, who helped uh, cobble together the TPP, she called it gold at one point. Now, after they were able to get that fast track authorization, she said, oh, actually, you know what? I don't think it's such a good idea because she knows what it's actually going to do to workers. Meanwhile, she thinks she can come out and be a huge hypocrite and talk about how Donald Trump doesn't know what he's doing. So, of course, in true Trump fashion, he is going to come after her tomorrow. And he says he's got a new plan for the crooked Hillary takedown. This is according to some declarations he, he's been making on social media, uh, calling crook, he's calling out crooked Hillary's bad temperament, according to a new book that's set to be released by a former Secret Service agent who said he actually witnessed Hillary Clinton throwing a Bible to the back of someone's head. Uh, but Trump's making it really clear that no issue is going to be out of bounds for him. He is, according to these posts, he's going to be coming after her on immigration, jobs, debt, the Clinton Foundation's acceptance of these foreign donations, and, of course, her help in creating the Islamic terror group ISIS. And that's something he really should be hammering on because a lot of people don't understand the ties and how Hillary Clinton was there the deal with Benghazi and how they were funneling weapons through Libya. I mean, just total dirty, dirty tricks coming out of the Clinton camp there. And now for those of you who are going to be outside protesting Trump's speech, wanting to make America Mexico again, why don't you take a look at what would actually be happening if you were in Mexico protesting? So there was a deadly clash once again between the Mexican police and protesting teachers. Now, they call these radical teachers union uh, the National Coordinator of Education Workers, they're opposed to mandatory testing of teachers as part of Mexico's uh, sweeping education reform. And they're also protesting the arrest of union leaders on money laundering and other charges. Of course, this is the corrupt uh, Mexican government, Mexican police that are, can just file these uh, fake charges and get these people out of their hair. Um, and then, of course, as we know, 40 plus were murdered bodies never found and this is just a small part of it but you know what a lot of uh, protesters think that that's what we need here in the united states of america just what a wonderful thing it would be if if protesters could clash with police in this way now the u.s house has rejected a bill to restore the fourth amendment now this is just four days after we saw what happened in orlando where this another terrorist was under fbi surveillance but it, it, completely useless, apparently, but the House has rejected efforts to end this warrantless government spying. So, of course, they were able to use the Orlando terror attack to scare everyone into thinking that we need that warrantless government spying. And, you know, the government can continue to excuse itself from the bounds of the Constitution because terrorism so once again, you know, we're getting screwed here. And then Justice Sonia Sotomayor spoke out about another Fourth Amendment ruling that took place on Monday, and she said it's going to corrode civil liberties. And this one had to do uh, a case involving a Utah man who contested his arrest for a stop by police that was ruled unlawful. And the high court ruled that evidence found on the man could be used as evidence even if the search of his person violated the Fourth Amendment ban on unreasonable searches and seizures so now they're saying that this is, it's totally okay. A cop can stop you. And that's what she's arguing here, that there, it's going to be disproportionately against people of color. Uh, but it doesn't matter if you're black or white or poor, rich, guilty, innocent, whatever. This is basically setting a precedent that cops can now stop you. They can ask for your papers, please. They can violate your rights and you can be subject to the whims of any police officer here. So this is um, definitely a precedent setting case. And now there's four upcoming decisions going to be taking place this week on affirmative action, abortion and immigration. So these are some pretty important um, decisions that are being made here this week. And also we've had a series of gun control measures that failed to clear the Senate as well. Jakari Jackson has more. The unfortunate mass shooting in Orlando has once again brought along calls for gun control. And while many people will try to convince you that Americans all across the nation are calling for stricter gun restrictions, uh, if you go talk to the gun shops or the big box stores who have been selling these things out the door since the incident has happened, it's not exactly that 
clear cut and cut and dry. Now I'm going to talk about some of the gun control measures that failed here recently. And before I get into this article from Fox News, I want to talk briefly about the situation that's going on in Connecticut and also New York, where they had a look at the gun control bills, basically the uh, the SAFE Act's going up there, and those remained unchanged. Now, what we're going to be talking about here is something different from that. And as we talk about the gun control measures that failed to clear the Senate, we see uh, four of them here. We'll start with the one from Senator Chuck Grassley, and this was to enhance funding for an existing gun background check system, which needed 60 votes to pass. The final vote was 53 to 47. Now, first of all, now this isn't going to be a debate whether or not we should or should not have gun background checks. I understand have shall not be infringed and all that. I'm just talking about as the, the system as it exists today. Uh, when I go to a gun store or I go to a gun show and I purchase a firearm, I always go through the NICS background check system where I give them my ID, I fill out the paperwork, uh, they call the FBI or whoever they have to call, and then uh, they see that I have no criminal record and they give me my firearm. Now, that's my case. If you have criminal records or you're on a terror watch list or whatever else, you will be denied from that system. So I don't see any issue with the system as it exists today. People say that they need to have um, various uh, mental health screenings. And that's another whole issue that I think is not exactly up to snuff with where it needs to be before we can implement that across the board. Because we've shown you the studies of the DSM-5 where you have any kind of uh, variable in your mood or personality. They want to call that a mental health disorder. That's why I'm very skeptical of things like that. We'll move on now to the second measure here by Senator Chris Murphy. And this would expand gun background checks to close the supposed gun show loophole that failed 44 to 56. Now, once again, as I was saying, when I go to the gun show, every time I bought a gun from the gun show, I think I bought two guns from a gun show. Both times I had to go through the background check system where I gave the guy my ID. I filled out the form. He called FBI, whoever he had to call. And they realized that, you know, yes, this guy is safe to sell a firearm too. Now, I know many people out there will try to convince you if you go to a gun show, there is no background check. Uh, the, the guys are just, you know, swapping guns left and right. And is it technically legal for a independent, you know, being myself, not an FFL dealer to sell a gun without a background check to somebody else? Yes, that is legal, but this notion that you can go to a gun show and not have to have any background check is completely false, and this is evidence uh, courtesy of Steven Crowder. What is this? This is a Nick's background check. Oh, I thought at gun shows you didn't have to do a background check. Oh, no. No, no, no. Okay. I know technically you can't sell it, but are any of these fully automatic? Negative. Real quick. Sorry, I'm in a hurry. Can I get a gun here without a background check? <laughs> and that's a more realistic view, even though it's comedic, of what happens when you go to an actual gun show. Let's go on to uh, Senator John Cornyn. He was proposing a delay of sale to a suspected terrorist for 72 hours. Once again, this sounds very reasonable on its face. And I'd like to give uh, Senator John Cornyn credit and say that maybe he doesn't understand the system as it exists today. And we've done numerous reports documenting uh, people who are on the terrorist watch list, the no-fly list, if you will. And we've shown you the reports of Boy Scouts and little girls and you know, kids with candy stuck in their teeth getting kicked off of planes because they have the same name with the same birthday or whatever else as a suspected or, you know, listed terrorist. And while we would like to believe that we are in a better world where a government official or official could identify that, no, this little Boy Scout is not an actual terrorist. He's just a little boy. That kid got kicked off the plane. So when you have these measures, including the next one we're going to talk about with Mrs. Feinstein saying that, uh, basically, if you're on a terror watch list for anything, you won't be able to buy a, a firearm. Just basically take anybody on the terror watch list and expand it out to other areas of life. The issue with that, as well as the issue with uh, what Cornyn is proposing, is you're assuming that these systems work as they are today. And as I just gave the example about the little kids, they do not work perfectly. So let's take the example of that little boy, New York Times article, Boy Scout, or the little girl, you know, four or five years old, whatever she was, not being able to board that plane. If you expand this uh, no-fly list to a no-buy list or no, you know, whatever list, that means when those kids turn 16, they're not going to be able to get a job. They're damn sure not going to be able to join the military when they become military age. And on the terror watch list, oh, definitely not. That's my issue with these watch lists. Now, 
in a perfect world, if they could get out these kinks and find out who's really on the watch list, I would be more adept to something like a 70, 72 hour uh, delayed for, you know, a suspected terrorist, uh, you know, uh, perpetrator. But until they can fix that, I'm not a fan of this at all. There are many things that need to be fixed at the ground level to get these things worked out before they can go nationwide. And that's just some of the things that happened here in the world recently. Thank you so much. And back to you, Leanne. Well, after the Obama administration embarrassed the heck out of the attorney general, paraded her around, said that they were going to release a partial transcript and why they were doing it. And then hours later, they went and released the full transcript because they knew they looked like fools. Well, now the Obama administration is doubling down on the fact that they're not going to say radical Islamic terrorism because it's a Republican political talking point. And that's why the president is not going to use it. Well, now there is a Muslim scholar uh, speaking with Fox News who actually came out and said not calling out violent Islamism by name taints all Muslims. And by not calling it out, you're not making a separation within the community. So this means all Muslim people are now being uh, tainted and that the Muslim community needs to be engaged to help eliminate the extremists in their midst. But it's something that's not going to happen if the president refuses to call it out for what it is. And but you know what? <laughs> Black Lives Matter, they are saying it's white supremacy and capitalism. It had nothing to do with radical Islamic terrorism. This is a new Black Lives Matter. They put out their statement and they said it was due to supremacy, white supremacy, patriarchy and homophobia of the conservative right. There you go, guys. And also the gun did it. Now, stick around because we got some more reports coming right up after this. There are plans here in Texas to put through a high-speed bullet train going from Houston to Dallas. Now that may sound like a good thing, and it could be a good thing, except that it's turning into the people who are in between the two cities, people in the rural areas, are literally being railroaded out of their private property rights. And without private property rights, you are nothing but a slave. This is another case of eminent domain. And we've seen through Supreme Court decisions with the Kello decision and others, where increasingly eminent domain is being used, not necessarily for public use, but for the private use of a corporation. And then we see with the Keystone Pipeline and now with this Japanese bullet train that is going to be built in Texas that they're working on, we're seeing that being handed over to a multinational corporation. Now, there's also been a bait and switch as we've seen this uh, project develop here in Texas. We're going to talk to uh, one of the judges, one of the county judges and one of the counties affected by this. And of course, a county judge in Texas is really the chief administrator. He's kind of like uh, a mayor of a city. Uh, the county judge has that kind of a position in the counties here in Texas. We're talking to uh, Judge Trey Duhon of Waller County, and he's going to outline to us what the problems are with this, because this is a national issue. And it is an issue that this country was built upon. This is the issue of whether or not you will be allowed to own and enjoy the rights to your property or whether somebody who has better political connections is going to be able to take that from you at their will. Joining us now is Judge Trey Duhan. Now, let's, let's give people an idea of how this has come about, because a few years ago, uh, the people in these counties, when it was sold to them originally, they said, hey, this, this sounds like a good idea. Maybe this would be something that would be helpful. But at that time, they said it would be going over existing right-of-ways that were already being used by roadbeds, by power lines, and that sort of thing. But then they changed that. That's right. I mean, you know, when this first came about several years ago, because we, we've been engaged now in, in this fight now for going on, I think, four years, um, that was one of the things that a lot of folks felt pretty strong about, that if you're going to build something of this nature, you should build it along existing infrastructure um, rather than going out to an area um, that has a certain way of life and just taking land and condemning it and turning it into something it's it's, it's not. Um, obviously, with a bullet train, um, it comes along with a lot of other things that is not consistent with some of the things that we have here in Waller County. Um, obviously, Waller County is a, a we've always been an agricultural county. Um, we have a, a very strong rural um, and agricultural heritage. 
And uh, we do have a lot of growth going on in Walter County, being that we're adjacent to, to Houston. Um, but the areas that they're trying to run this train through, um, it would just create a dead zone. Um, instead of being prime residential development or mixed retail or other uses, um, any land adjacent to this project is going to, the highest and best use might be, you know, grazing or yeah. agricultural. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem for a lot of folks in Waller County. And of course, what it is also is a case of the rights of the few uh, being taken by the multitude and uh, the way in which they're doing this. You have a lot of concerns about the process that they're going through with eminent domain and the fact that they're trying to take this property when they haven't even decided on the exact route yet. They're going to take uh, property for a couple of different routes and they routes that they won't even use. Yeah, that, that's right. And I'll and I tell you, uh, it, it is disconcerting for, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, you've got you've got the two elephants uh, in the room with Houston and Dallas that think that this would be the greatest thing, you know, since white bread. Um, and they're pushing very hard uh, for this project. And the problem is that we have a number of issues with with the project. I mean, number one, none of us really believe that this project is going to cash flow. Um, it's being sold. Uh, the taxpayers are being told that this will be built with, with private money. But the fact of the matter is nobody can actually tell us if it's going to be operated that way or if the state of Texas will eventually have to subsidize this because there's really no high speed rail lines in the world that aren't publicly subsidized to some extent. Yes. Uh, it's not a mass transit solution, not at the ticket prices they propose. You're not going to get the ridership that you need when you can travel between Dallas and Houston on a $50 tank of gas. Why would a family of four pay over $1,000 for that same trip? So we have a number of issues, but, but what has really come to a head that is ex incredibly troubling um, is the actions of the, the rail company, Texas Central Railway, in filing these recent petitions with the Surface Transportation Board where they are in effect asking to be exempted from certain regulations and requirements so that they can have the power of condemnation prior to the route being finalized and prior to the environmental analysis being completed, which by the way, we, ha we have a major problem with the way they've done the environmental analysis because we don't think what they're doing is in accordance with NEPA, but you know, that's just, that's a, a major side note, but you know, to, to think that and, and to go so far as to even admit that you may take property that you may not eventually use in the final route, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's tyranny, to be honest with you. I can't imagine. I mean, there has to be a public necessity. Yes. That's a basic tenet uh, when you're going to exercise eminent dom domain. Yeah. And if you're taking land that's not going to be used in the final route, where's the public necessity in that? Well, I have a problem with the fact that it's a private company that's going to take it. I mean, you and I both don't believe that this is truly going to be a private company. What they will do is they will privatize their profits. But if they lose money, as we always see with these massive crony capitalist projects, if they lose money, that's going to be put on the public, on the taxpayer. Uh, but at the same time, if it is a private proper, a private uh, corporation that's running this thing through, uh, I don't even believe that they ought to be able to take it for the eminent domain. Uh, but it's gotten beyond that, as we see that first the private corporations take that, and then we have a multinational corporation, like in the case of Keystone Pipeline, comes in and says, well, we're going to take your property. Now we go to the extent they say, well, we've got a couple of different routes that we want to do here. So we're just going to take all of this land, even though we may not use some of it. And then they're taking shortcuts in terms of the eminent domain process, aren't they? Uh, there's no doubt about it that they're taking shortcuts. And I'll, I'll give you just a few examples um, that I think, you know, kind of outline um, the shortcuts they're taking. They, you know, back in April, on April 19th is when they filed these petitions with the Surface Transportation Board to be exempted from certain regulations and to, to go forward and have that condemnation authority. They did, they did so at that time with no notice to landowners, cities, or counties that were affected. And then they didn't come out until, I think it was on May 4th. Um, that was 15 days after they filed it, but only five days before the deadline for comments on their petition, 
is when TCR publicly announced that they had filed these petitions, you know, some two to wow. three years earlier. And it's like, if it's an open and transparent process, which TCR says that they are doing, why why doing this in the middle of the night without any heads up or notice to anybody? Now, thankfully, um, we are organized. We are not a bunch of backwoods hicks. We know what we're doing. But we were in, we engaged quickly and and filed replies and responses to these petitions, along with comments from thousands of individuals that you know own property between Houston and Dallas. And, and the point you made earlier, and let me say this, this, this is an important issue for everyone, everyone that, that owns property, everybody that pays taxes, whether this project is going to come close to you or not, because you're right, they will absolutely, when this thing fails, and I do believe it's not going to cash flow. Um, in fact, one of our state representatives, Cecil Bell, very interesting, if you go to, if you look up his website, CecilBellJr.com, and go to the high-speed rail, he's actually put a calculator online where you can go and plug in numbers and you can see how this thing will not cash flow. It will not cash flow at whatever ticket prices and ridership because it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. But it's like I, I try to tell people, it may not pass through your backyard, but it will pass through your pocketbook. Yeah, that's it right. Absolutely that's right. will impact everybody in the state of Texas. So- and it will impact everybody nationally because we keep seeing this in different parts of the country. I mean, you know, first it was in the Northeast, we saw this happening, then we saw it uh, happening in uh, uh, the Midwest with the Keystone Pipeline. Now we see it happening in Texas. And each time they go farther in the process. This guy literally works 18 hours a day. And he says, well, I did, I said I worked hard at other campaigns, but this one's so historical, so epic, I can't help it. This guy is amazing. And, and so he's here. Everything he's told us to turn out to be incredibly accurate to tell us what the firing of Corey Lewandowski symbolizes, but moving on, where the Trump campaign's going, how we ensure this maverick patriot ends up getting in the White House. So Roger Stone of StoneZone.com, thank you so much for taking time out. Today. Well, Alex, as you can imagine, I have several hundred press calls today uh, from across the country, uh, and everybody, which is very typical of the mainstream media, very focused on process, very focused on the who shot John of political intrigue, missing, I think, the larger implications. So I have elected, in all honesty, to lay low. I'm not going to take any press calls today. I'm going to do all my talking right here at Infowars.com. Uh, as you know, I've said for some time that the historical track record of presidential campaigns that had internal divisions and factions is not good. Eight years ago, when we had uh, a the uh, uh, Mark Penn versus Mindy Grunewald fighting within Hillary's campaign for president, I think, frankly, it doomed them. You need to have the unity of command. Uh, a campaign cannot be a democracy. Uh, it has to be a dictatorship, and all power must flow from the candidate. The candidate's the ultimate boss. The candidate has the ultimate authority, uh, and he needs to delegate that to one person, not a committee. So um, I have every confidence in Paul Manafort's ability to guide or help guide the Trump campaign uh, to uh, success, to victory. I also think that you are going to have um, a, uh, a smoother flow of information to the candidate. Donald Trump is a, a thoroughbred with great instincts, particularly great instinct for the jugular. There is nobody better at counterpunching. Uh, and we're at a time in the campaign, Alex, that his entire issue has been validated. The fact that they are uh, redacting these 911 calls to take out the references to ISIS and the leader of ISIS proves that Trump's criticism of the president of roughly a week ago is right on the money. They, they have another agenda. They will not even mouth the words except for when they absolutely have to. Wow. Well, thank you for giving us this exclusive. Uh, Roger Stone, please, you've got the floor. We're going to skip this network break. Talk about 
issues that held things up if you can, but I agree we should just move forward. But folks do want to know, since you're making a statement, and then let's move forward from here. But what what great news to, to know that your business partner in, 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 in your political group uh, has been you know, helping the Trump campaign, but is now the head of the campaign. You, of course, formerly the head of the campaign. Uh, I have complete trust in you and Mr. Manford. So this is very exciting. Well, Alex, and I've said this to you before, both privately and on the air. This campaign is not about Corey Lewandowski or Roger Stone or Paul Manafort or Alex Jones. This campaign is about our last best chance to save the country. The Republican establishment's doing everything possible to undermine the candidacy of Donald Trump. They don't respect the democratic process. Attention, Paul Ryan, we had the primaries. You lost. Mitch McConnell, you lost. The party has selected its nominee, at least on paper, and in reality, very shortly. Uh, what the Republicans don't understand is that Donald J. Trump and the Trump revolution is bigger than the Republican Party reaches beyond the Republican Party. Uh, in many places, I think the campaign was hamstrung by uh, dual authorities uh, and countermanded orders. Uh, but I don't think it's productive to go into a long discussion of everything that was wrong with the campaign. Uh, I think the campaign has achieved historic things uh, under, uh, under the leadership of Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, you certainly saw in the New York, Indiana, uh, California, Pennsylvania, California primaries, uh, a smoother running political operation. There's no question the Trump camp is playing catch up ball. They need a communications director. Uh, they, need a, uh, they need additional field staff. They need additional party professionals. But now I think the deck is cleared to do that and to build a smaller, leaner, more guerrilla oriented campaign that is still large enough and fast enough to compete with the well oiled Clinton machine, which, as you know, is a massive, massive biography, a uh, massive uh, political machine. Absolutely. I know you've been doing research on their biography, though, and boy, is it a nightmare. Roger Stone. I totally agree. We should move on from Lewandowski. I have nothing against Lewandowski other than every time I saw major mistakes being made and him up there bragging about things on TV, it seemed to be about Lewandowski. Though every time we're talking about Trump with you on, you'll never even talk about yourself. So, I mean, certainly he was putting himself, I think, in many cases, you know, in front of the campaign. Uh, I think he was a bit entitled, and I'm sad to see that happen. But it's good news that he's gone now, obviously. Now, I made a prediction that's coming true. It wasn't hard to predict, but... Obviously, we want Trump to be the presumptive nominee, and we want to just go ahead and put that to bed, as we did months ago, and say, okay, he's won you know, these states. You know, He's the guy. The problem is, is that I know how these Republicans work. They're playing possum, these rhinos, Paul Ryan and others. And I said, wait till they get right up you know, closer to Cleveland. They're going to come and try to defect again and you know, shoot Trump down and pull some scam. They know they're losing the battle by being out in the open because you put Stop the Steal out, millions coming to Cleveland. But I said, we gotta come to Cleveland. We gotta be there. I expect some more shenanigans, some more fiascos, some more hanky-panky because these losers think they're God and, 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 and think they can step in front of the Trump bullet train. Now, as you know, it comes out they've got a stealth campaign going uh, to try to uh, steal the delegates again and, and pull something. Now, obviously, it's going to be ill-fated, but it shows how incredibly piranha-like and arrogant and disconnected they are uh, that they're doing this. So let me ask you, what is your view on this? What do we do to counteract it? Well, Alex, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there is, uh, there's trouble afoot uh, inside the convention hall as well as outside the convention hall. So let's talk about both. Uh, I still think in the end, uh, Manafort is the master of campaign rules uh, and credentials uh, and the platform. Uh, he's a superb vote counter. And whether or not this little insurrection, which the media themselves reports uh, is, is uh, being carried forward by dozens, dozens of delegates, not hundreds, not thousands, but dozens, I think it is ill-fated. Uh, I don't think it's going anywhere, but it is incumbent on the Trump campaign Keep a very close eye on it to make sure that you don't get a runaway convention. The idea that you would pass a conscience clause of the, uh, uh, to the Rules Committee that would allow delegates to opt out of their party rules-based commitment to vote for Trump on the basis of the democratic process 
and the way the people voted is outrageous. You, in essence, would be saying to the Republican primary voters, your views don't matter. We don't care what you think. You, you voted for no reason. You wasted your it vote. It says our conscience, our conscience trumps your conscience. It's outrageous, uh, and, it, and it's, it's arrogant, frankly. It is the arrogance of the ruling class of the Republican Party. Meanwhile, it's the creme de la creme of arrogance. It's the cream of the cream. It really is. Uh, meanwhile, in a story that was really broken here on InfoWars before anyone, the city of Cleveland seeks to gag uh, and, uh, and destroy the First Amendment rights of those who wish to go to Cleveland to uh, demonstrate in favor uh, and protest uh, these Come hell shenanigans. Come high water, I'm coming. Come hell or high water, and everybody needs to be there. Well, I, I'm going to be there as well, but uh, I can now report two things. One, that the city is insisting that the uh, that all demonstrators, left, right, middle, Black Lives Matter, Infowars.com followers, Trump supporters, Citizen for Trump members, uh, MoveOn.org will all be in one area, unsegmented. There will be one microphone. The city will control that microphone, and you can apply if you wish to speak. They have already uh, given permission to speak to a number of extraneous groups that don't matter. Uh, it's be a so, yeah, they're going to fill it with like underbenchers that don't even matter their own people. That is, oh my God. And they won't, they will not let us, they will not let us let's control us. government channel. Yeah, they will not let us have our own rally. They will not let us have our own march. They actually gave the rally site that, that we had applied for to the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, they don't seem to have they much trouble. They around and scream anti-gay stuff and then claim they support Trump. Yeah, exactly. No, this is, look, let's be very clear. The city of Cleveland is a Democratic machine stronghold. Cuyahoga County is a Democratic machine stronghold. This is a recipe for violence. This is a plan to achieve violence. The whole point of, of our people applying for a permit would be so that we were engaged in a lawful activity and that the local them. police would, would defend us. On the 26th of April, 1986, the worst nuclear power plant disaster in history occurred at the Chernobyl plant in the Ukraine. Chernobyl was labeled as a level seven, the maximum classification on the international nuclear event scale. At the core of the blown out reactor and buried under 14 meters of rubble, the graphite surrounding the nuclear fuel burns and melts the uranium. The radioactive fallout is going to be a hundred times greater than the combined power of the two atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Years later, on the 11th of March, 2011, the Fukushima meltdown reawakened public awareness regarding the ever-present dangers of nuclear power. So we're about 270, uh, 276. So we're maxing out around 280 or so. And remember, 30 is what's normal for this location. Now they're disputing that this isn't the cesium-137. They're saying this is radium and other things that naturally occur in the environment. Whatever it is, it's abnormally high. With the recent earthquake activity stirring in the ring of fire, the Diablo Canyon power plant located near Avila Beach in San Luis Obispo, resting near not one but four fault lines, is a clear and present danger. The second fault, known as the Hosgri Fault, was only discovered after the plant's completion. In November of 1927, the Hosgri Fault generated a 7.1 magnitude earthquake 10 miles offshore. A 2013 document filed by former Nuclear Regulatory Commission Inspector Michael Peck insisted on closing down Diablo until the commission determined whether the plant's equipment could survive higher seismic stress levels. In 1981, Diablo was incorrectly retrofitted when employees failed to reverse the plans for the twin reactors. Regardless, the Nuclear Regulation Commission approved the safety of Diablo's monstrosity of incompetence. Diablo has a seismic monitoring and safety system ready to shut it down immediately in the event of significant ground motion. The motion is detected by sensors in the ground and provides three-dimensional data on seismic conditions. But that won't stop the potential damage unleashed by the fuel rods as witnessed during the Fukushima debacle. Of course, Pacific Gas and Electric would like you to believe this ticking time bomb is good for jobs. Energy consumption of its two million recipients 
and the way forward as old man coal is aggressively shut down. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. But the voices opposed are many. After President Richard Nixon called for construction of 1,000 nuclear plants by the year 2000, 1,900 anti-nuclear movement protesters were arrested in 1981 during a 10-day civil disobedience blockade of the Diablo Canyon power plant. With the main gate cleared and the last blockader in jail, Pacific Gas and Electric made final preparations to start the reactor. But then, at the last moment, PG&E publicly admitted a grave mistake. There are two reactors at Diablo, mirror images of each other. The blueprints for units one and two had gotten mixed up, and the earthquake supports for the cooling pipes, the same cooling system designed to prevent a meltdown, had been installed backwards. It was the first of hundreds of mistakes discovered later, all made on the two and a half billion dollar structure described by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as the most highly analyzed building in the world. Today, most locals and tourists are completely unaware of the passion Californians vented against the nuclear energy mafia just 33 years ago. Fukushima resting right over those mountains. I don't know what you're talking about. Experts would have us just bury our heads in the sand, but some are already preparing for the inevitability of America's Fukushima. If Diablo blows, nobody's staying around to use it. I've, I've actually got backpacks in my car, you know, for heading out. Um, preparedness, I think, is very important. Yeah. But the whole idea that they're going to sound the sirens and we're all going to head north, it just won't work. Yeah. Northeast. So yeah. I wish it wasn't there. Mm. But it is, and maybe they'll de deactivate it, and that would be fine with me. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it's great how uh, the citizens on our own can be prepared, um, yet, you know, we're asking our government basically to take care of us, and they're, you know, telling us to look the other way. Yeah. And how can you do that when all of this is at risk? Well, it always comes in the limelight once there's an earthquake. Mm -hmm. So the Snapa earthquake has made everybody kind of think about it again. You know, that a good earthquake would cause the plant to blow and uh, would want to get out of here. When you look around and you see all of this beauty, all these families, all these people, how does that make you feel knowing that they're okay with a potential Fukushima situation here in America? We know we, know we couldn't all get out. You know, they say head north, I mean, yeah, head east, northeast, once the plant warns us. Um, but you know that you couldn't do that. The freeway would be jammed. Uh, that's why, you know, we know we could go across the Santa Maria River bed and head south. Um, I raised seven children in this town, and I taught them all to run home no matter what the school told them because we were going to hop in the car and get out somehow. They weren't going to wait for school buses. But, yeah, it's a big problem. They say we provide 20% of California's power at that plant, mm -hmm. but I think they named it Diablo for a reason. As the purported Chinese curse goes, may you live in interesting times. For Infowars.com, I'm John Baum. Okay, leftists, let's play your game. MP Joe Cox was murdered by a violent, crazy, anti-EU right-wing extremist. That means all Conservatives and Brexit voters should be guilt-tripped into accepting responsibility for Joe Cox's death. That means voting to leave the EU would be disgracing Joe Cox's memory and siding with the murderer. So what about Michael Sandford, the British citizen who tried to assassinate Donald Trump? Is everyone who screamed about Donald Trump being a fascist a Nazi and literally Hitler, responsible for the assassination attempt. Are the 600,000 Brits who signed a petition to ban Trump from entering the UK to blame for radicalising the would-be assassin? Are the innumerable left-wing pro-EU politicians who labelled Trump a threat to democracy culpable for the crime. Is it time to tone down the anti-Trump rhetoric? So what about Omar Mateen, the gay nightclub gunman? He was a registered Democrat 
and he supported Hillary Clinton. Does that make Hillary Clinton responsible for Omar Mateen's rampage? Does that mean Hillary Clinton should suspend her campaign out of respect for the Orlando victims? Does that mean Hillary Clinton should be repeatedly asked for the next three weeks if she disavows Omar Mateen? Will you unequivocally condemn David Duke? And second, how do you feel about the David Duke quasi-endorsement? So what about James Wesley Howell, the man caught with guns and explosives on his way to a gay pride parade in LA. He was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Does that make Bernie Sanders responsible for Howell's plot? Does that mean Bernie Sanders should suspend his campaign in order to prevent other Bernie supporters from becoming radicalized? Does that mean Bernie Sanders should be repeatedly asked for the next three weeks if he disavows James Wesley Howell? Why not disavow David Duke? All right, I disavow, okay? You see, leftists only want to play this game when they can change the rules on a whim. They lie, they cheat, they misdirect. After months of ignoring violent anti-Trump protesters, the regressive left is suddenly all concerned about violent right-wingers. Give me a break. You don't care about right-wing violence. In fact, you welcome it because you can use it as grief porn to callously push your political agenda. Meanwhile, crazy hysterical radicalized leftists continue to plot and carry out violence, safe in the assumption that the mainstream media will do everything in its power to twist the narrative and bury the truth.